Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Sunday evening after our presentation at Almost Heaven Star Party 2019. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Carrie Liss of Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. Uh, he's already done his warm up act with the audience, so everybody's ready to listen, and it's going to be interactive as you before. So people will ask questions for clarification it's as we go along. And uh, I think Carrie will probably be very good at repeating the question, so it's clear to so. everyone because we won't spend time passing around the mic. Um, Dr. Liss has been at APL on project teams for interplanetary missions for many years. Uh, we invited him to come up last year. He very graciously offered to do so, and then we proceeded to get wa washed out. Um, and he uh, it was willing to come up again, uh, taking time to come over here from, from Maryland. So please welcome Dr. Carrie Liss. Pardon me, it's already beginning to get too warm. This is not part of the act, thank you. <laughs> it's starting, starting to get warm. So because I'm here a year later, you get to actually hear about the flyby of MU69, the Kuiper Belt right. that happened on January 1st of 2019. So while you guys were all partying, we were working. That's us. <laughs> so a year's delay has led to a lot more interesting things. So thank you for having me here. Tonight I'm going to talk about man's first exploration, uh, in situ exploration of the Kuiper Belt with the New Horizons spacecraft, as you can see very nicely silhouetted here. This is an artist's impression of the object we went and visited. Thank you for your commentary. <laughs> okay, so in my old age, I've learned that sometimes go long, people fall asleep, stuff happens. I'm showing you my conclusion slide. <laughs> I do that right up front, and then what I do is I fill in everything here. It's going to give you some curiosity, some questions, hopefully. So this is the object in question. Let's see if we get the laser. Ah, there we go. So here's our result. This is what we found. Apparently it has a little black spot on the screen. That's not us. Um, there's all kinds of interesting structure here, which I'm going to talk about, which helps us understand how we think it formed. And that's what this little cartoon, we're going to talk about how we're seeing this. And we're comparing it. These are three comets that we've actually visited in the inner system. You might notice a strong similarity in the shapes. And I will tell you something that I was spectacularly wrong on when we flew by Hartley 2 with the Deep Impact mission. I was part of that. I was one of the proponents arguing very strongly that this is just two bodies randomly stuck together. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, that this was one body that was eaten, that was roughly spherical, made randomly in the beginning of the solar system, and then it was preferentially eaten away at the neck. The other model was it's two bodies randomly stuck together. Well, we're seeing this in the Kuiper Belt at 45 AU in a circular orbit that's never any been anywhere near the sun, and it sure looks like it's two bodies stuck together at the beginning of the solar system. That's why we explore. Two, I would think, perfectly reasonable hypotheses, but you can't really distinguish between them unless you actually go and test. Okay, so let's go a little backwards. Everybody know what the Kuiper Belt is? Yes, no? Okay, all right. So the Kuiper Belt is a ring of small bodies, think of snowballs, all the way up to Pluto, which is smaller than our moon, about 1,000 kilometers in radius, that surrounds the classical system that you know and love out, um, from Mercury all the way out to Neptune. This, ob this belt is the edge of the original protoplanetary disk that made our our all of our planets. At some point, if you think about it, the original disk has to peter out to zero and eventually becomes just the interstellar space. But there's a region in between where there's enough mass to make planets and interstellar space where there's enough to make snowballs but not planets in the age of the solar system. And that's the Kuiper Belt. Every star in our galaxy should have a Kuiper Belt. Everyone should start with a disk and it, which has an edge. Not everybody should have an asteroid belt. It's not clear that you can actually have a stable asteroid belt and not clean it out. But everybody should have started with a Kuiper Belt. So we're now visiting our own. We call it the third zone of the solar system. Many arguments are that there's a million objects here, more than in the asteroid belts. So there should be lots of them. And we think that the current Kuiper Belt has been mostly cleaned out because Neptune moved out from where it used to be. We have a lot of what we call dynamical evidence. I'll show you that a little bit later. We can see bodies that look like they were swept up by by Neptune, we can see other bodies that were scattered out by Neptune from the original ones that were just going in nice circles around the sun. All right, so this also shows the New Horizons launched in January 2006. We fly by Jupiter, and we, w we were one I think I'm going to talk about this already, but I forget. I've merged two sets of slides, and I apologize. I've been doing a lot of things in between now and the last time I gave this talk. Let me see. I don't. I'm skipping over stuff. Yes, we did. Okay. 
All right, I'm going to get to that later. So I'm going to talk about the fact that this was moving at 3.5 AU a year. This is the fastest thing ever launched off the surface of the Earth. It's not the fastest thing ever moving in space. First, that was Voyager 1 and 2. Now it's Solar Probe, because when it dives right near the sun, it's going 600 kilometers per second. You work that out, it's 0.02 C, C being the speed of light. It's a big number. When you're diving, when, if you look, look at your Kepler's uh, law, when you're at the perihelion, and the closer you are to the sun, the perihelion, you're, just, you're really moving. So let's move on a little bit. These are Kuiper Belt objects. There are quite a variety of them, OK? And just to show you, the Pluto is the largest. Eris is a close second. And Pluto has a moon that's one half its size. Our moon is one quarter of our size. And whenever you see that kind of ratio, it immediately tells you impact origin. We can go into that later if you want to talk about it more. But important to notice is that Pluto, all the noise about it being a planet and this and that, is still smaller than our moon. On the other hand, Pluto has five of its own moons. Our moon doesn't. It has weather. It has hazes. It has cryovolcanoes. It has uh, glacial flows. It has mountains. It's got all kinds of things going on. And Pluto is an incredibly interesting world, even if it may not be very big. It is the king of the Kuiper Belt. And it lives right out here, near the, as I mentioned, at the edge of the solar system. There's our classical planets. And again, just to beating the problem to death, here is, if you want, Pluto versus the size of the moon and versus the Earth. So our spacecraft is not terribly big because we needed to get out to Pluto in our lifetimes, nine years, in fact. So it's the size of a baby grand piano. It's powered by plutonium-238, which is not fissionable and it's not scary. Please don't eat it, but other than that, it's used in pacemakers, undersea um, cables, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we flew about 300 watts worth of power, which, if you think about it, your blow dryer is a kilowatt. Your fridge uses up about a kilowatt. So this isn't terribly huge amount of power. We're really good at light weighting and light uh, and, and making very small power and small mass instrumentation. We carry seven science instruments, a lot of them double duty, like our radar antenna, radio antenna that talks back to Earth, is also a radar dish. And if you ask us the one thing we would change, if possible, this is what we had at launch. What I just bought, <laughs> I think I literally bought this from Walmart, oh, I put it in my backpack. I have a new, brand new flash drive, it's 32 gigs, cost me 10 bucks. Well, this is what we had, we, we, we spent a lot of money on the 8 gigabyte. <laughs> Uh, solid state recorders when we launched, but as you know, the technology keeps increasing more and more. Okay, so the detail, I won't go into this too much because I have a lot of slides, but we have everything from a clear imager, so this is our NAC, we call it a narrow angle camera, high resolution. We also have a WAC, a, a, slower, a lower resolution but color imager to relate to what you all use. We have an ultraviolet spectrometer, we have radio and radar as I mentioned. We have particles and fields measuring the solar wind, and we also are able to count dust particles. And that's all we could carry. We'd love to carry lots more, but there's only so much you can do. Total mass is about 40 kilograms. This is roughly the same mass we're expecting, by the way, and this is a borrowed slide. This is roughly the same mass we're expecting to be able to put on interstellar probe and send out to the nearby galaxy. And apparently I put two versions of that slide in. So here's New Horizons. And what's cool about this, that's a graphic. This is the rocket, this is what happens if you open up the fairing and you have to like, are seen, it's getting put on the upper stage. This is the inside of this. Pretty cool. Launch went just fine, swimmingly. And we launched on January 19th, 2006. We got to the moon in less than a day. Okay, the astronauts usually take about a week. We were really moving because we needed to get out to Pluto. We got to Jupiter in less than a year which most missions take five years because they want to stop. <laughs> we were just, we, we did have, and people often ask us why we didn't go to Pluto and stop, and we usually tell them that would have been another billion dollars for breaks. Um, just literally to get out there, if you wanted to actually go in a, in a, get captured or go out and stay there, it would have taken two or three times longer because you need to go on a very long approach, slow orbit to match it. We had the luxury that we are just going right by. So from launch to flyby, it's only nine, nine and a half years. Pretty fast. And Here's what we learned in the meantime when we used Hubble. We found Pluto, and Sharon was known in the 70s. But then we found these two guys, and we found another two guys with Hubble. We didn't find any more when we got there, which is interesting. I lost a bet on that. <laughs> we also didn't find any rings, and as you probably know, all the outer planets have rings. So this is the way it looked. And if you want to know where New Horizons is now, there's an app. You can actually go to our webpage, and it will tell you exactly how far it is away from the Earth. And it's still going fine. Our spacecraft is healthy after two flybys. Nothing wrong with it. You want me to, ha, ah, thank you. Okay, so I have a little bit of time. This is, when we went to Jupiter, we actually got a big increase in velocity. We just did kind of a, um, we got a kick from Jupiter. 
What you do is you go behind Jupiter in its orbit and Jupiter kind of pulls you, uses the angular momentum in its orbit to pull you along and then throws you out. And we also practiced with our spacecraft on some of the using some of the instrumentation. So here's some beautiful images of Jupiter's moons casting shadows. That's the great red spot, which isn't very red, right, in this. My favorite one is coming up. Let's we'll see what place it does. This is Io. Look at the size of those kilometers. Those are tens of kilometers high geysers. There's one there, there's one there, and it's too bright here. There's another one there, but you can concentrate on that one. Isn't that gorgeous? And if you see this in real color, it's got all the colors of brimstone, yellow and brown and red, everything sulfur, because it's got sulfur oxides. It's just gorgeous. Now, I just look at this and go, holy, holy my gosh. This is the most volcanic place in the solar system, more than us. Um, I think close to, oh, that's, you're asking a really good question. <sighs> I've never been asked that before. Um, it has to be, I don't know what the lag is between them. I'll have to look that up. I think it's minutes, but it's not, it's not seconds, but I think it's minutes. But it's not hours or days either. Uh, because we move through the system pretty fast. Um, I'm sorry, I can't, who asked that question? Oh, I can, one, there's one thing I can do before I forget. I have business cards. If you're interested in contacting me and following up on these questions, pardon me, I guess I'm sorry you're recording this part, but I will forget if I don't send them out. I think it's gotta be minutes to, to hours, but on the other hand, remember we don't have the same angle. We're, we're, we're really moving by through the system very fast. So if anybody wants to contact me, please don't all take one, but whoever would, speaks up and would like to contact me, please take a card. So we go by Jupiter, we practice, because I'm, there's a lot of MU69 slides to show you, I'm going to skip immediately to the Pluto flyby, which happened on July 14th, 2015, also known as Bastille Day. Okay, and I've now managed to actually see the band Bastille in concert and go to their back rooms because th the boss likes music. <laughs> so, I um, wish it was a little darker. Everything, we can t go, um, everything from the haze, this is when we look back, we see this beautiful blue ring of atmospheric haze in Pluto. We see these beautiful little tiny, if you know how well you can see them, these little, we call them bacilli. These are little pits in that giant. <laughs> in the giant glacier. So Sputnik Planitia is this, what everybody knows is the left ventricle, the heart, if you will, half of the heart of Pluto. And we now know this to be a giant glacial cap inside a giant depression we think was due to a huge collision and impact early in Pluto's life. Not the impact that forms Charon. That would have been much bigger. That would have been so big that most of Pluto's surface would have melted and been distorted. This is more like a few, uh, maybe a kilometer sized object. We think that one of these in the age of the solar system would hit Pluto. But this is so deep that it can actually freeze out the nitrogen in the atmosphere. Just a few degrees pressure um, cooling is enough to actually force the nitrogen to go from gas into solid. If you look in detail, down over here, you'll see that there are actually places where the sunlight can cause evaporation and make pits. There are other places that we see on the upper left part, we, see, we saw flows. We saw this all immediately. You can see actually flows into what looked to be mountains. And we could actually see stuff diverting around here. We also noticed that there were what looked like cells, which are very similar if you took water and oil and put it in a little pan on water and you made it convect. And we realized this whole thing looks like it's a nitrogen ice glacier which is being heated from below. Heated from below tells you there's internal heating. I lost another bet. I would have bet before we got there that Pluto could very easily have just been a very boring ice ball at the edge of the solar system doing nothing for the next, until the heat death of the universe. It's absolutely not doing that. We see, see we have the cryovolcano. So we have evidence for what looks like cryovolcanoes. We have convecting cells in a glacier. We think that this whole the thing was like maybe over here and there's been what we call true polar wander. Um, if you take, put a large amount of mass on the Earth, it will actually rotate to put it on the equator. Pluto has five moons. It's a dynamic, interesting place. It's doing a lot of things. We know now that it has methane and nitrogen and carbon monoxide and water on its surface. We know it's got a moon, which is a good fraction of its size, which as far as we can tell, the only way to make it was by a giant collision of a body that came along, hit Pluto, smeared off, um, most of it became part of Pluto, but part of it sheared off from Pluto and reformed and made Charon. This is the exact same story for how you make the moon. We don't know how to make, you can't make it by making Pluto too big and having fission, you can't make it by capture. The only way we know it is by a giant collision. 
when the, when the moon becomes that big compared to the primary. So lots of really cool things. And let me move on. So this is a close-up. We call this the coffee table picture. The nice thing about this picture is this is if you're looking glazing. You can actually get a sense of the ripples and how big these mountains are. Those are bigger than the Rockies. And this is Sputnik Phoenicia. And so if you were going hiking, well, I'm, we're here on this beautiful mountain. You would, go, you would have a very interesting hike if you were hiking across Pluto. Uh -huh. And see these bands? That's the haze. And you actually see different bands, and then there's a really thick, cloudy haze layer about seven kilometers up. We think this is organics that are made by solar wind ions coming and hitting nitrogen and methane in Pluto's uh, upper atmosphere, making hydrocarbons, nitriles. And they slowly condense, but then you get down here, they suddenly hit a pressure region and temperature region where they, they polymerize, and they make these really big droplets. They, oops. They make clouds. They make this stuff. So they're making really cool, cl beautiful clouds. So here's Pluto's blue sky, which we didn't know. Nobody ever saw this. You actually had to go beyond Pluto and turn around and look backwards. Okay, so what you're seeing here, this is Pluto's disk, and you're seeing forward scattering. The light from the sun is coming through the haze towards us. There's no way you would have seen this the other way around. And yes, it is blue. That's not artificial coloring. These are the five moons, Pluto and Charon. Before we went there, Pluto looked like maybe a blob with, a, you can see it maybe 10, 20 pixels across it. Charon was maybe one or two. Now we see these two moons. You can see that we didn't get too close to Styx and Kerberos, so we, Styx is still just an elongated, slightly resolved blob to us. But we actually see structure here in both Nix and in Hydra, which is due to a little collision. There's some structure and coloring. Kerberos does show that it's bilobate. And I'm going to point out, remember that bilobate structure I showed you for MU69 and intersystem comets? We're seeing it again. Seems to be very common in the solar system. Okay, just to give you a little idea, Pluto is, um, we came in a little bit looking towards the North Pole. The South Pole is a little hidden. Here's the equator. Here's that beautiful Sputnik Panisha, one half of the heart. And we're very depressed, by the way. We did not sell a lot of t-shirts with Pluto for Valentine's Day the next year. <laughs> because apparently somebody went out and said Pluto has a very icy cold heart. <laughs> Sigh. There was a big marketing campaign. It's okay. We were very happy with this. And I can tell you one of the things that was most exciting on this mission and why I'm lucky to be doing this kind of thing is I'm one of the people that at 5.30 in the morning, we were all very grumpy. We got to, we were the first human beings to see this image ever of mankind. Humankind. And as we were all agog for about 30 seconds, then immediately being the good science where we're going like, oh, cool, look over there, there's a crater. Oh, wait, there are mountains over there. And we're like kids in a candy store. It's that sense of exploration and discovery that's just awesome. I can't describe it. And it makes all the work, hard work, uh, worth it. Okay, so let me move over. And Sharon, uh, so, so Sharon, I talked a little bit about. Sharon has a Grand Canyon. It looks almost like it got, um, it froze and cracked that goes the length. And you can see it actually in profile here. It's just huge. And it's got an ancient crater textured surface. We think this is stuff coming, some of that haze coming off of Pluto and dumping onto Sharon's pole, both its north and its south. You can't see the south here. So Sharon looks just like our moon. It looks like it, something happened to it very early on, but now it's been frozen in time. The same way that the craters on our moon or the archaeoastronomy I like to think about, they, have the, they hold the secrets of the light heavy bombardment. What you're seeing are 800, or you're seeing craters on the moon that were formed about 4 billion to 3.8 billion years after the, um, from now, before now. So they're at the, what we call the late heavy bombardment. Everybody know about this? Yes, no? So the Kuiper Belt, I mentioned, yes, where we're going. Uranus, um, the planets didn't, form where they are now. We think there was something called migration. They moved around a little bit. In 600, 800 mil million years after the beginning of the solar system, so somewhere around 4 to 3.8 giga years ago, the Saturn and Jupiter go into 2 to 1 resonance and they start kicking everything in the solar system all over the place. Asteroids get thrown all over the place. Uranus and Neptune move out. Neptune scatters most of the Kuiper belts and there's, there's basically chaos in the whole system. All the impacts you see on the moon, all those craters and top of craters, that's from the late heavy bombardment. What's really cool, for those of us paying attention, is that 100 million years or less after that is the first evidence of life on Earth. So is that, I like to think of that's because that's when the first period of life chow, the first organics were brought to the Earth and water to the surface and made, basically took a barren lava, uh, frozen lava surface, which is what the Earth was after it cooled, and turned it into a place where life could, could grow. Pretty cool. So it's all kind of multiply connected. All right. so. Sharon, by analogy, if you will, is this is all ancient history that you can't see on Pluto, 
because Pluto has got ices and weather and refreezes the same way that the Earth got just as beat up as the moon. We were just as cratered, but we have both weather and plate tectonics. All those craters have, are pretty much have been wiped out. But we're just, we have 16 times, excuse me, 20 times the gravity and 16 times the surface here. We should have just as beat up as the moon. But fortunately, we healed and you and I can talk about it. Okay, so this is another cool thing you can do. This is our closest approach image, but we resolved not as well because we're farther away. This is Pluto, an entire 6.4 day rotation. Excuse me, revolution, yeah, rotation and revolution. Pluto and Sharon are doubly tightly locked. And meaning, think of like two ice skaters. We're all looking, they're, all, they're spinning, but they're always looking at each other. The equivalent on Earth would be if the moon was always stuck over the Pacific and never moved. Our moon is, is, we only see one side of it, right? It's tidally locked, we only see the near side, but we do not spin with a 28 day period yet. The moon still moves around in our sky, but imagine if um, ages come, uh, go and moon has moved out as far as it can, they're still locked, and we are going a 28 day period. Our days are very long. Then the moon would be st stuck in the sky. That's what Pluto and Charon. And this is Charon over one of its days, 6.4 of our days. <coughs> okay, you can imagine that we were very happy about this. Anybody find the speaker in this picture? It's kind of like finding Waldo. I am in here. You get an extra pizza. Very good, right there. Yep, that's me. This is Jim Green, by the way, the leader of NASA Planetary Science. He's very happy. This is APL. We're all seven in the morning. This is the big boss run who runs our science department. We're all very excited, and actually, this was a really weird day. Because we were told this is when we had just flown by Pluto, and we had. And we had no idea the spacecraft had survived because it takes four hours for the signal to get back from Pluto. On top of that is you don't send a spacecraft for nine years to an object and then tell it to immediately turn around and phone home. You tell it to go do what it was sent to do. Take all those pictures, measurements, etc. It's not done until nine at night. That's so we didn't know whether we had good data for about 14 hours after this. So this is an exciting moment, but you know, we're all kind of on pins and needles for half a day. Okay, everything worked out swimmingly. Spacecraft was fine, we didn't hit any dust, we had worried about hazards, everything's cool. What do you do next? Well, we knew that we had about 25, 30 kilograms of hydrazine left. We, have, we can maneuver. And we knew that our spacecraft was perfectly healthy. Nothing had happened to it because of the Pluto flyby. So we wrote a proposal saying, well, if there's anything in front of us, smaller Kuiper Belt object, because we're on the very edge, inner edge of the solar system, oh, excuse me, of the Kuiper Belt. Pluto's here, oh, stop that. Wrong button, sorry. Pluto is at the very inner edge of the, of the Kuiper Belt. We had the whole Kuiper Belt to traverse, and basically we could use Hubble Space Telescope. We asked for 200 orbits. I don't know if folks know, but one, your average proposal for Hubble gets one or two or maybe five. We asked for the whole kit and caboodle because we are in a unique place going to unique, in a unique time and a unique place going to the first traverse, if you will, of the Kuiper Belt. So we got we're given 40 by the director and told that if we found the expected number of other Kuiper Belt objects that we expect in the survey, we'd give them 160. Turns out we found MU69 in the first 40, but we got the other 160 anyway. Found a whole bunch of other Kuiper Belt objects who actually in really improved the understanding of the size distribution of Kuiper Belt objects. So it's all very good. Um, where, and you're going to notice that Kuiper Belt MU69, this isn't hyperbole, it's about in the middle, the heart of the Kuiper Belt, about 45 AU. We're past that now, and we're hoping to find another object, but we haven't found anything yet. Because it turns out, after we're all done with MU69, we still have about 10 kilograms of hydrazine maneuvering fuel left. It took us 12 to go from Pluto to MU69. We could do another flyby. That's assuming there's something in front of us. Okay. I mentioned the Kuiper Belt, um, and I mentioned there was evidence for it's been scattered and pushed around and beat up, right? It's not the original Kuiper Belt it was born, born to be. And here's the evidence. This is what we call a semi-major axis inclination. So this is a quick way of putting all the orbits together. Semi-major axis is just how big is the orbit. And inclination is how much is it tilted versus the ecliptic. If you're a circular orbit, you have zero inclination and you lie along here. And this is where the planets would pretty much lie. Here's Neptune. And this is where Ultima Thule lies. And that tells us that Ultima Thule hasn't been messed with. It pretty much formed in place. It's on a nice circular orbit. It's pretty much been there since the beginning dawn of the solar system. Oh, pardon me, <laughs> keep moving around. The, you'll notice that there's a large spike here. This is a huge number of objects that have been all collected by Neptune and put what we call in a orbital resonance, a three to two resonance. 
They go around the sun three times every t for every two times Neptune goes around. Neptune has basically grabbed them. Jupiter does the same thing with our inner period comets. Comets go around twice for every time, one time Jupiter goes around. And these are called Plutinos. There are 40 different objects. And for those of you in the audience who want Pluto to be a planet, you can. Then your kids are going to have to memorize 40 other planet names and their heads will explode. <laughs> but it's, that's okay. I've been told that's, that's, that's science and that's progress. So these are all the Plutinos. These are all Pluto's cousins. Okay? These are called resonant objects. These are called classical, cold classicals. They just didn't care. Neptune never messed with them. These guys, this hash, they're scattered. They used to be in nice round orbits. But Neptune came in and kicked, their, <laughs> kicked them all over the solar system, kicked a lot of them out. But some of them just kicked up and pumped them up and put them in all kinds of crazy orbits. So that's what we call the scattered population. It's this scattered population that leads to our short period comets. I should watch the time. We're doing 25 minutes. Oh, we're doing fine. Okay, so I mentioned Pluto. We did wonderful task. We have, this is the most detailed and planned mission I've ever been on, and I've been on a number of them, including Cosmic Background Explorer that found the Big Bang Radiation with Nobel Prize. I've been on Deep Impact that had to hit a comet. This one is incredibly detailed in terms of its organization, in terms of its practice. Um, we had to go to a target that's 80 times smaller than Pluto. We were going four times closer because we had to get good imaging of this smaller object. We didn't exactly know. This target was discovered in 2014, <laughs> not in 1930. Okay, and then we had to figure out where it was. Unknown environment, four times darker target, which means our cameras were going to have tougher times picking it up. So a lot of reasons why this was just really hard. Also, we ran, we're, plutonium-238 doesn't last forever. Our power's running out. And we have not four hours, like, uh, one way relative time, but six. So we, you know, again, we, you couldn't joystick this encounter. You have to plan it all ahead of time. Good news is we'd figured out how to do things. Okay, you guys are like to look at the night sky. Where's MU69? <laughs> I should have mentioned something. Pluto, and if you remember, I, we only had so much fuel. Basically, we threw ourselves towards Pluto. It's so within two degrees of the galactic plane, the galactic center. You couldn't pick a worse place to try and find something. MU69 turned out to be magnitude 27 visual. So I am still in awe that the folks on this team could do that. So they could take that and they could just hammer all those stars away, get understand the, the tails and the stars, you know, understand the wings of the PSD. Point, pop, point sp uh, spread distribution? PSD? Yes? Point PSF. PSF, sorry. PSF. Sorry, loose tongue. But um, they could do that and they could find MU69. Um, just amazing. It helps having Hubble, which has a pretty nice sharp PSF, rather than AO from the ground. But Okay, so what else did we need to do? We could find it with Hubble. We could try and look at it again and again. But are there any people who do occultations in the audience or ever done light curves occultations? Okay, you know, folks know what an occultation is? Yes, no? Yeah. So you stare at a star and you wait to see if an object goes in front of it. And if you understand the orbit well enough, really well, you should be able to predict the, the, the time of when that, uh, that star actually winks out. So given the Hubble observations, folks predicted in 2017 and then again in 2018, that there would be uh, occultations in Argentina as well as South Africa in 2017. In 2018, it would have been Colombia and Senegal. I had the good fortune to go down in July of 2017 after they had failed in June and then failed again in July early, but it turns out they didn't have the latest and greatest Hubble imaging. By the time I got there in the middle of July, they had actually used, gotten an update from Hubble and we got a good occultation. And there's a whole buddy-buddy story. Can you find Waldo in this picture? <laughs> He's there. This is us in Patagonia. We, these are the most expensive trucks I've ever, 1,700 bucks for a week. It's an, it's, it's, um, in terms of it's um, Argentina's oil city. And two thirds of their energy comes from this, this town. It's, if you look at a map of Argentina, it's down here which you pr where there's a big kind of semicircle. The Falklands are not too far away, and we saw a lot of memorials to the Falklands. And it's quite a ways away from Buenos Aires and the heavily um, populated parts of Argentina. When we got to the airport in Buenos Aires, they were wondering why 20 Americans were all wanting to go to this town. We got asked a lot. Okay, we were setting up. These are giant Dobsonians. So they're about yay tall. They come in two crates, and we set them up like IKEA furniture. We're doing this in the middle of no, well, I, it's uh, not dissimilar from what you guys are doing here, except for the fact that you probably have prepackaged and everything you know pretty well, and you've hauled your things as one piece. This had to be shipped down. There's our computer, our laptop, which is not allowed to talk to anything. It was totally clean. It didn't talk to any nets. 
And here are different teams. Here's another team. They're having a good time. We, on the other hand, basically we went out to Highway 3, which is the equivalent of their I-95, and they turned off all the lights in the city. They stopped the trucking because the lights were messing with us. We were parked, we went to a place where there was like a 20 degree incline and we went through the guardrail, well, me and my teammate, Roger, I think we'll see Roger in a second, and we actually went down into a gully where there was a water and oil pipeline and we thought we were protected by this big giant hill berm and the sky was gorgeous the night, two nights before. We actually had to stop playing tourist. Alpha Centauri, is, oh. Magellanic clouds were pretty. We had to stop doing that and actually get to our work. And, and our whole work pretty much entailed doing, here's the, looking at the horizon, telling, setting up the scope. You probably do this a lot with yours. Looking at a check, two check stars, but we used uh, Beta Pick, excuse me, Beta uh, Centauri and Fumahol. And then we went to Nunki, our you know, a nearby star, and then we do offset guiding. And, that's, and then ju we just sit on that star, the one that's going to get occulted for an hour and a half. That's all we have to do, all. We have to do this in a brand new site where the telescopes that we've never seen before with kind of ancient software. So we had to practice a bunch. The night before we do this, clouds come in. We'd practice, and I should say, Roger and I, were the, were we, we, we won the gold star, for, no, the lead star for being the worst team. Our very first night we practiced just at a nearby college near um, Commodore Rivadavia, the town we were in, the oil town. And we couldn't get things to work. Turns out we had a crappy cable to our CCD, and they hadn't told us. Roger, Venable, who is a backwoods Georgia ER doctor, wonderful guy, was, I'd, well, I'd reserve again with him a second. I think his picture is, that's him. And here's actually the detailed map of where we were. This is their route, the equivalent of 95, and we just pulled off right over here, on, as I said. So clouds come in, we're screwed, we think. Night, it's just not gonna work, kinda like tonight. Well, then the next day, it's forecast 30, 40 mile hour winds. And we're going, whew, maybe they'll clean out the clouds. Sure enough, they did. The problem is that where we thought we were protected, and we were in a nice little gully where the wind was being stopped by this hill, there was no wind that night. The night we're observing, there's 40 mile an hour winds down there. Roger is swearing a blue streak. He's really good. He's, he's actually taking this picture. And, but he'd been hating this ground tarp the whole time we'd been there. So he came up with the bright idea of pulling the truck right next to the telescope to block the wind. I realized he hated the ground tarp, and I said, okay, you're really doing all the work. I'm kind of the guy there troubleshooting, helping out. But he's the uh, expert with the telescope, just like you guys are. I know, I'll stand with the ground tarp in the back of the truck and help block the wind for an hour and a half. <laughs> so that's my job, and this is Roger, and Roger being a doctor who has, I have four brothers who are doctors, having a delightful sense of humor, posted this and said, this is Casey breaking wind. <laughs> <laughs> this is what doctors do, oh my God, you're recording this. He literally did that, I, I'm gonna kill him for that, but I actually thought he was great, he's the reason this worked. He was swearing, he was very unhappy, because he couldn't get a good focus check because the, it was just rattling around too much. And I was kind of, in this case, I was playing also cheerleader. I said, Roger, we've come all this way. We might as well try it, darn it. Turns out we got the long cord. We got the one that actually connects between the two lobes. I'll show you in a second. We also got the worst PSF of the five teams who got cords. We did better than the team right next to us who set up on the object and didn't paddle. It just said, the PI basically said to the amateur astronomer, you will not touch this again. The guy who really knew the telescope. And Roger's sitting there paddling furiously with me. And I'm going, go team, go. And the other guys actually, the star wandered off because the wind was bad. So anyway, we have the worst PSF, but we actually have the best cord. That's him. And let me show you. So we got the one that actually goes through. Actually, did we show the cord on here? We got the, the cord that goes from here through here. And this is the team that missed. At the time, we thought it was a sphere, so we weren't worried about the fact that one was missing. Now, then we realized, no. The reason we were able to do such a good the reason we were able to do such a good encounter with MU69 is because the occultation really nailed the orbit. Okay? And by the way, this is the real image. So this... Okay. And to show you how well we did with this, and actually I'm going on for this for a minute, besides the fact that it connects up to what you all do. This is the actual imagery. This is what we estimated from the occultation. That's in pretty impressive. But this also shows you we actually now have ground truth. We're not going to build another New Horizons in the next 10 years and throw it out there, but if we can do lots of occultations from the ground, and we've just shown you that we can do a pretty good job with occultations and get the, real, the real shape. So my humble opinion, and our occultation cost uh, campaign cost about half a million dollars to send 20, uh, 50 people out to Argentina. So my humble opinion, there's good science to be done. 
doing a lot of occultations, and we're pursuing this. So if anybody in the room is interested, I'd like to pick this up and can help. A fellow named Mark Bowie is looking for you. Is that shown with the rotation rate taken back from the flyby? How did you get the rotation aspect? Well, there, there is one, you're asking a good question, but there's also another reason why this fits so well. MU-69 turns out to be rotating in the plane. It made our life very easy. It also made, was driving us crazy. We couldn't get good light curves on the approach. We kept trying, different groups were coming up with somewhat different answers. It turns out we were all trying to analyze systematic noise because there was no change in the projected surface area. If, if I'm doing this, there's a huge change, right? If I'm doing this, there's almost no change. Okay, so to give you an idea again to why it was hard to fly by, Al this is Ultima Thule set on a picture in real size of Sputnik Planitia, the, the ventricle, if you will, left ventricle of Pluto. You can see how small it is. So this is our trajectory. We went over the North Pole. We like going over North Poles, apparently. Uh, <laughs> and Ultima Thule, the ecliptic plane, here's the shadow. We can only, because this is a fast flyby, we don't have time for Ultima Thule to rotate and even it's also rotating the plane of the sky. We're only going to get a sunlit atmosphere. Okay, uh, I think I'll go through this just for. Okay, so here's your optical navigation. Again, I think I put this in because I think you guys might like. So here is the raw image. This is our onboard LORI camera. This is what we're now using to find another object. If you out there, here's our processed, and that's with the star subtracted. Pretty good, huh? I'm just amazed at this. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm this, I don't show this to every audience, but I figure you guys would like it. So yeah, there's some awesome software, and I believe it's public. If you are interested in this, I think I, we could put you in contact with the folks who built it, and we're using it for new right. But you can see this is very important. Not only were they also trying to find the target, they're trying to look, we tried to look for moons and rings. One of the things we haven't found is the mass of MU69. We can only estimate it. If there had been a moon with an orbit and a period, we can use Kepler's third law, but we don't have that. So I can show this for a while, but we should move on a little bit. <laughs> All right, so this is um, also to point out, January 1st was the flyby. Oops. So you can see that we're taking all the data we can. We have to also make decisions. We had to decide how close we were going to get to this. We had the closest possible approach, which is 3,000 kilometers, or what we called Shabbat 1 and 2. There's way too many Jewish people. I can say this. I'm also a member of the tribe. The Shabbat, if you know, is <laughs> Saturday service, um, which it stands for safe haven abort. <laughs> But it's, it's a very interesting acronym. The point was is that there were a number of different trajectories we could take uh, in case we think there was a lot of dust or something that could destroy our spacecraft. We found nothing. We kept looking and looking closer and closer. We c and we had to make a decision right, right near, right about, I think it was three days out, so about the 28th, whether we're going to go in that close orbit, or close arc, if you will. And the closer we get, the better the images. So we want to go close. But we also want to have a spacecraft that, sort of that can actually send back the data. Did you get the roller craft? You're very good. And I did not pay this man? Okay, so we're going to skip really fast. And I'm going to go and show him, and we're going to come back. The reason why <laughs> do we have it? So here's the rotation, by the way. That's the movie I wanted to show you. And you see how it's almost not changing at all in terms of as and it, There's a little bit of out of plane rotation, but not much. And I wanted, I thought we had the, ah, here we go. So this is the forward hemisphere, and you're seeing it at different angles, so this gives you a little idea of stereo. We're doing our best to try and pick out what are these structures. For example, look at this guy and spend some time in trying to figure out. This looks like the biggest, widest, fast. We think that's pretty sure an impact crater. These guys we think are sublimation pits. But I wanted to show you real fast. This is us actually flipping around and turning back and looking backwards. And we're trying to get the, as much as we can of the night side and all you'd get is a crescent edge, but this edge can actually help you constrain this, the shape, which is very important. So yes, we did have to roll. There was a lot of tracking through. So we basically have to go over and kind of turn around at the same time. So I skipped over a few things, pardon me. Okay. So, uh, so there's lots of science objectives. Basically, we want to know everything. But detail, ge geology, shape, What's it made of? What's going to happen to its structure? Can I tell if it's been hit? How did it form? And we actually can tell an awful lot. It's amazing to watch the thought processes as we dig into what is really just a series of simple images and spectra. Um, if we're searching for ices that we think could be stable in a body that's never been anywhere near the sun, think this object is, if you will, a proto-comet or the grandparent of an inner system comet. 
and it's never been heated up because it's never been near the sun. So we're looking for all the things we think would be in comets that have never been heated up. We're also looking for satellites and rings I mentioned. Short answer, we have not found any. And gas and dust as well. This object shouldn't be active because it's still around after four and a half billion years and it's cold as can be. So we didn't expect it to be active like a comet. It's not anywhere near Rosetta's target, which is only a AU or so from there. It's 45 times farther away, which means one over 45 squared less power falling on it from the sun. Okay. This is busy, and I won't go into more detail other than to show you that these are all the different instruments, and this is all the plans we had and all the things we had to do with them. It's very complex. There are incredible people who are willing to go through and schedule and work all these different things out. You have to worry about the data rates. You have to worry about where you're pointing, which instrument can look at what. It's a quite a traveling salesman problem. But all I can say is that we're very lucky. There are people who are experts on the team in doing this, and we learned from the Pluto encounter how to do this. So we were able to, so a fellow named John Spencer, Dr. John Spencer of SWERI was the fellow who led this. I like this because this shows you, as, so this is, if you will, real size on our CCD as we're coming in, okay? Get, you can see that it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and gets better and better and better as we get closer and closer. And the data playback is still continuing. We're going to take 20 months from January 1st, 2019. So we've got another year? A little more than a year? Now, we were getting at best kilobit per second from Pluto. It's probably down to 600 uh, bits per second. Oh. Depends on how high um, the spacecraft is above Goldstone. But thank you for asking. Yeah, so it's not trivial. <laughs> it's not easy either. Um, for those of in the audience who are gray beard like me, remember the bad old days of dial-up? <laughs> it's dial-up speed. And now, part of that is because we also had to lightweight our antenna for reasons of power and mass and also money, we are, did not fly with the, the, the big an antenna as we would have liked. But it's a NASA mission, it is what it is. Sir, uh, what's the plan, the final plan? It's a very good one. Uh, the long-term plan is after if there are no more planetary things, no more Kuiper Belt objects we can look at, we'll turn into an astrophysics mission and a helio mission. We'll do what the voyagers are. We're gonna sample the solar wind and the cosmic rays all the way out. And we'll also look at the galaxy and what's between the galaxies once we're outside the cloud of this, uh, the dust that surrounds the er Earth and the Sun called the zodiacal cloud. So we're going to do some astrophysics. We need to point. If you, if you were to do it, you would, uh, the helio stuff you can do in a slow spinning spacecraft as long as you're making sure your antenna is pointed back to the Earth. But, so we have less than 10, about 10 kilograms of hydrazine left. If, you did, if I didn't mention it, Unlike a lot of other spacecraft, New Horizons does not carry um, reaction wheels. It doesn't carry wheels that allow us to turn. You know, it's like you're sitting in a chair and a bicycle wheel and it turns you when you turn it. Think of it like a gyroscope in reverse. Um, they're too massive, they weigh too much. So instead, we're actually actively pointed using hydrazine, little thrusters. So I'm trying to look at you and I'm drifting. I'm going back and forth and keeping myself stable. So every time we look at something, point something, we use hydrazine. We're normally spun as we're cruising and we unspin, unspin, or unspin in order to stare at something. Okay, let me move on a little bit. I got Ah, okay, 10 minutes left. So, MU69. This is a contact binary, and what we saw was an object that's about 33 kilometers long, so this is a bit bigger than the biggest comet nucleus we ever think we've seen, which was Hale-Bopp, okay? Definitely two lobes. The smaller one's called Thule, the larger one's called Ultima. Um, we do now think it is a merger of two planetesimals. I'm going to show lots of interesting things. The geologists have a grand field day with this. First of all, notice on Ultima, it looks like there's, we call it almost monkey bread, or think of like a cinnamon roll. See how there's regions? It looks like they're stuck together. You might notice that their regions are not dissimilar in size from this whole thing. So it's very possible that this was the original unit, something about this size. And this is actually polyglot, a bunch of things stuck together. <coughs> You'll notice there are also lots of craters, but they're most easily seen here on the edge. That's just an illumination effect. You know, a phase of the moon, you know, that if you look straight down, if the moon is full, it's really hard to see craters because you're, you know, the whole thing is illuminated. You don't have a light dark pattern, which your eye can pick up real easy. Craters here are just like that. It's only 12 degrees uh, off. The, the sun is almost straight at noon here. It's only 12 degrees off. Here, on the limb, you're actually bending around, so you have a very different illumination angle. We do not think that there are more craters here than here. We just think it's easier to see them. And I'll just point to you. There's lots of little circles. The fact that these are in a row tells you that most likely they're not impact craters. They're most likely um, sublimation pit chains. 
lots of stuff. I have a whole model for this, by the way, <laughs> is that this object probably formed at the very beginning of the solar system. Well, maybe I should wait until we get to that. I'll, I'll get back to the cartoon in a second. That's where I'm going to go. Okay. Give me a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to end on that note. All right, so we see an object that is amazingly uniform in color, possibly if we stretch it really hard, a little bit different here and some few other places. Two ideas. One is that you're actually punched through a dark crust and seeing ices below. The other is that these are gravitational lows. The latter seems to be the case. It's just simply some dust that's fallen down in there and has somewhat different scattering properties. Ice, we're not seeing fresh ice. We got a spectrum of this thing. We notice that the spectrum looks an awful lot like Centaur Pholus, which is the reddest thing in the solar system, and is a very distant um, centaur far away from the sun, and also a Plutino, a resonant object like Pluto, that is far away from the sun. And it's very interesting that it looks like other objects in that it looks like it's got methanol and some water. And I am about to deliver a talk in Geneva. I have a whole paper on this. If you were to expect, the, uh, if you were trying to figure anything that could possibly be in this object and give it four and a half billion years, sitting at roughly 40 Kelvin, which is its surface temperature, the only things that are going to be stable that we also find in comets that in large amounts should be what we call hydrogen bonded ices. So anything that has, like water has hydrogen bonds between the hydrogen on one and oxygen on another molecule. So that includes things like methanol and hydrogen cyanide and ammonia. But you shouldn't see things like nitrogen or carbon dioxide or methane, which we see on Pluto, by the way. And there's a whole story about how we get those and we don't get them here. But they shouldn't be stable on a little guy like this because it doesn't have enough gravity to hold them. Okay, I think I mentioned the rotation. I skipped ahead. So <coughs> I'm going to move us forward. And we're going to get to the pit chain. Don't worry. Play with that. Here's the shape. And one of the things we thought originally was it's two balls. And we're very much on the opinion now, lots of studies, that <coughs> you're not seeing two round things. You're actually seeing more like we hear, <laughs> there's a lot of breakfast analogies. I mean, sausage and pancakes. Um, <laughs> but what you're seeing is definitely things that are squashed and elongated. And this is giving you a hint that they were actually were not formed just as random structures, that there was some spin involved. And that's, we're, trust me, we're getting there. Right. I'm giving you all the hints. I'm giving you all the hints. So again, teeny tiny thing compared to Sharon even. Um, okay, beginning of the solar system. This is a fun slide I like to show because I also do debris disks and solar system formation. Remember when I told you this was the edge of the original protoplanetary disk? Okay, solar systems far time, about five billion years ago. Supernova in different parts of the galaxy. The galaxy is a giant pinwheel. The supernova go off once a century. Use your Star Wars imagination. Giant hemispherical uh, explosion. You light up the galaxy as much as you know. Supernova can be as bright as the rest of the galaxy combined. These shock waves propagate throughout an entire galaxy. If two of them ever come together or start intersecting, they're going to start forcing stuff down and clumping, and that's where star formation happens. That happened here five billion years ago. It's messy. About five solar masses, we think, started collapsing. Only one left on, pretty much, in, you know, in the sun. Within 100,000 years, almost a blink of an eye, you, form, you make the proto-sun, you collapse because there was a net spin to this cloud into a rotating disk, and you start throwing away most of the mass through bipolar outflow jets. Oh, by the way, if I'm not mentioning it, I'm not just cartoons. This is real imagery you can see on the sky. Probably know the Orion Nebula propylids, some of the folks in the audience. HH Tau, I don't know if anybody's taking a picture of it. This is a little baby solar system. Star is in there, there's the disk, and those are two bipolar outflows. Then you start, the bu you turn off your jets within about a million years or so, and you start making your, your primordial disk starts clumping. You start making your giant planets. You make your asteroids, you make your comets. Those then start cleaning out, and your Jovians turn on, settle down, move around a little bit. And then you start making your terrestrial planets like the one we're standing on or sitting on. And you do that in somewhere between 10 and 100 million years. You'll notice that in all these pictures, and then you clean stuff out, and you eventually get to where we are now. But you notice in all these steps, I'm showing you a disk which has an edge. That's that Kuiper belt I kept talking about. And you don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe this picture. Those are other people's Kuiper belts, all seen by Hubble. And the cool thing I like to tell people is since I also do debris disks, I no longer have to be a voyeur of other people's. We are actually going through our own. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Doctor, I have a question about the last slide. Sure. Uh, Fomalhawk, that ring around there, yep. uh, Fomalhawk, seems very huge. It is. To hold debris, if I compare it to our solar system, 
solar system. It's somewhere out beyond the orbit of Pluto, but a giant ring that is, contains an immense amount of mass. Is there any explanation for why that stays that way? There is. If you're going to hold me to two minutes on this talk, we're going to do that for question and answer. I just published a paper on this. It, Fumbaholt it's an A-star. Um, it's in a very, very quick nutshell. The th where solids, things like rock and ices, are stable, for an A-star that has 25 or so solar luminosities is a lot farther out. And 75 AU is the, is the remember, seven, uh, seven, no, 80-ish AU is the, is the radius of this ring. So you actually have to be a lot farther out. And it's also old, 400 million years old. Fumbaholt's taking a long time to make planets out of this ring, a lot longer than we did. So I think that's all because you have to be a lot farther out and dynamical time scales are, sl are slow down there. But let's talk offline, it's a very good question. Okay, so let me get to why we're trying, we can, what we can learn from this object. There's a lot of in going on in this slide, but what we think is that if this disk of gas and dust, as I mentioned in this pretty, pretty cartoon, it has gas in it. And what people are arguing now, that gas can, have, can support sound waves. It has oscillations, things ripple. And where you have sound waves, you can have pressure maxima and minima. Where there's a pressure maximum, there's also a density maximum. And if you've got dust there, if you put enough dust in one place, it'll start clumping. And we think that's the story for what we call streaming instability. Trust me, it's very complicated, and I've just managed to get that picture in my head. And that can lead to little clots in places. And those little clots, if you want to think of them like dust devils. Okay, so you've got these sound waves in places where stuff starts clumping, but there's also a lot of spinning going on. So imagine a little tornadoes. That's where the spin comes in, why there's we think there's shapes. So this thing didn't just come from a random thing, it's just a loose cloud, it's actually a spinning cloud. And that's why we think we've seen over and over again these shapes. So this is, if you will, in cartoon form by James Tuttle Keen, who's a member of our team and a wonderful sci young scientist artist. So this is inside one of those little vortices, this little sound maxima, if you will. It's also got some spin. So again, think of it like a tornado or dust devil that's collected a lot of dust and high pressure. And what happens is that it starts clumping, you think a few big bodies, and eventually what happens is in order for these guys to clump, they have to throw out the angular momentum energy on a third body and you get these. And that's why we're arguing we've seen these over and over again. It's telling us something. I've gone very fast on this. But we can, well, wait for question and answer. We definitely see this. We definitely know that there, the, whatever collision happened between these was very slow because we don't see a lot of damage where they stuck together. It's maybe a meter to a second connection speed, which you can do at home, by the way. You can walk into a wall um, and it's about the same speed. So it wasn't very hard. Uh, we can see evidence for densification. Uh, let me move on. Um, smaller bodies, like uh, comets that we have, are about the same as the same density as small Kuiper Belt objects. I'm running out of time. When we look at Ultima Thule's color, we notice that its color is the same as the other guys that have never been perturbed. It looks just like what we measured. It's just like the other guys that are just sitting in a ring and have been going around the sun forever. Not like the Plutinos, not like scattered objects. It looks just like the other ones that have been never messed with. And it's really interesting that we see, the other thing I should mention is the two different lobes, if they're two different objects, they're the same color. So that pretty much is arguing they didn't, and we see a large, if you look in this plot, we see a large range of color in the, in the Kuiper Belt object. Yet over and over again, when you look at an individual binary pair, the two guys in the binary are always the same color. That's telling you they formed together. It's pretty cool. It's amazing how with a little bit of simple logic and just some better observations, you can learn a lot. Okay, um, I think we're almost done. Yes, we are. So, I'm going to read this out then since I have a minute. So think of New Horizons as a time machine. We're basically going, this is the most primordial thing we've seen so far. When I got into the comet business, we thought that was going to be comets. But the more we learn about comets, the more we know is that the sun has heated them up and changed them. Uh, another way to put it is, a comet loses roughly a fraction, half a meter to a meter of surface every time it goes around the sun. That is the equivalent of you going out in your backyard every spring and seeing that two to three feet of your backyard is gone. That's what we call highly erosional. Things change. This guy has never had that happen to him because of sunlight. So that's why he's a time machine going back in the beginning. This the most primitive thing we've ever looked at. So that mentioned when I was talking about those little swirling tornadoes and then clumping, that's this pebble swarm accretion we're testing. We're also asking the question is we know something called aluminum 26. There were short term radioactives in the beginning of the solar system that baked and boiled things. Well, I skipped over it but we think when this guy first formed, he forms in a protoplanetary disk that's optically thick. What does that mean? He didn't see the sun when he first formed. He could condense the coldest stuff, everything that was in that, gas, that disk, including the stuff that's the most volatile, like hydrogen and nitrogen gas and CO and methane, everything, it didn't matter. Things were as cold as, as in the galactic space, 15 to 20 Kelvin. As soon as the disk dissipates, 
Suddenly, morning happens. Sun, he sees the sun. He starts boiling. He also feels internal radiation. I'm giving the he, it. And that's where I think what you're seeing here. See these spit chains? That's the very, very most hypervolatile materials, the stuff that we do see on Pluto, the nitrogen, the carbon monoxide, and methane, but are gone from him. We didn't see any evidence on this one on the surface. And so that's what's happening in the very, very, very beginning of the solar system. So he has been processed a little bit. The other reason the very, very surface is not pristine, although the large scale structure is, is that it turns out, if you think about it, every few hundred million years, a supernova goes off not too far away. Or an O or a B star passes by our solar system and can heat things up a bit. So I told you the sun has never heated this guy up, but he has been heated up a bunch. And we're talking centimeters and meters depth, nothing like kilometers. But the very, very, very surface has probably been aged and processed a little bit. So most likely the surface of this guy you're seeing, if we're talking about just the optical surface, the first millimeter or centimeter, is probably a few hundred million years old. So we have to be a little careful about when we don't usually think about processes in that scale. But he's definitely not been heated by the sun. Okay, so this is old. I, when last time I showed this, is this is, you can go on this app and it shows you where New Horizons is. And right now we're still moving through the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt goes from about 30 um, AU from the sun out to about 60. Okay, so we, MU69 was in the heart. We're hoping there's something in front of us, but we haven't found anything. And we've gotten a pretty good search in that direction already in order to find MU69. So we have that 10 kilograms. We could do another flyby. And I think that's it. And I just want to say the extended issue continues. I just said this. And if we don't do another planetary flyby, we just go out. We have power until about the mid-2030s to run our instruments, do our helio instruments. And that's about 100 AU from the sun. So we are going to be, at worst, we become like the Voyagers. Okay, so it's still cool, and I'm going to, this is my last slide. And I would just, as, as I mentioned, this was the conclusion slide. And hopefully I've explained a lot of this. I'll leave this up, and, if there, and I'll take any more questions. Um, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. <laughs> and you didn't bark once. Are there any questions? Three. Have you ever won a bet? Uh, <laughs> on this one? <laughs> on this mission? No, actually. That's an interesting question. Um, plenty of other things in my life, but this one, no. There was actually a running, oops, there was actually a running um, lottery for what we would find at Pluto. Everything from when we find more moons, when we find a ring, and I figured we'd find another moon or two because we couldn't see them from the ground, and we didn't. So, um, I forget who did win, but that's why you explore. I mean, look at all the things we did find. Nobody... They'd known from light curves from the ground that there was something strange about what they called the um, anti-Sharon point on Pluto, Sputnik Planitia. But, but they knew that there looked like there's for some reason it was emitting a lot more methane and CO. You could see this in near-infrared um, narrowband light curves. But they didn't know why. And so you didn't, we had no clue until we got there that there was this beautiful structure and what was going on. So I, just to me, it just means is that ground bases, one is observations are nice. If I may put it in another context, I've been doing comets for 30 years. And we've done wonderful jobs from the ground, but it wasn't until Rosetta actually got to 67P and, or, and orbited it and spent a revolution with it. Look how much more we learned. So I'm not trying to say everything you guys are doing is great, but you're probably building a foundation. We need it all to go visit these things. Now, we're not going to visit stars and galaxies, not, in our, not at least in my lifetime, unless one of you gets off this. I was supposed to invent the warp drive or the time machine, and I've been very <laughs> slacker. So unless somebody does that, we're not going to these places. So we still need to look at them remotely. But does that help a little bit? Yes. Yes. Feel free. Uh, what's the prospect for more plutonium production to power missions? We are actually, that's, that, that's happening. Um, in, in the, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what is the prospect for more plutonium production? So in 2012 and 13, we realized that we were running out, that the Europa Clipper and, and Mars uh, MSL was going to use up most of the remains, remaining plutonium-238 that NASA had. And most of which was made in the 60s and 70s by people who were uh, radio chemists and people who were involved with, if you will, weapons production as well. And a lot of that knowledge is gone. But we started up with DOE and NASA funding after some discussions, a lot of discussions back and forth about who was going to pay for it and who was going to do it. Idaho Falls and also I think Savannah uh, River are now starting to make more plutonium-238. They're making the order, I think, tens of grams to maybe hundreds of grams a year. We want to see them make a few kilograms a year. But they're starting to do it. What you do is you take tunium-237, you breed it up, but then you had, it has to cool off. You put it in a reactor, 
and you actually mutate it. But then you have to pull it out. You have to let it, all the very shortly radioact uh, radioactive decay. Then you have to separate out the plutonium-238. So you have to do radiochemistry. So this is all done in these glove boxes by, you know, extreme tr personnel who are doing what you think might be simple chemistry, but they have to do it very carefully. They also worry about their solvents getting burnt, you know, all lots of things go on. So there's a lot of expertise that is being rebuilt. But we do need it. Uh, the question, if you haven't, uh, for the general audience, is we simply can't use solar panels outside Jupiter. Um, and ju the Juno mission that is flying by Jupiter is using 60 meters squared of solar panels. So that's about the limit we can do. If you want to fly uh, uh, past Jupiter, you can't use solar energy. Not with current technology. You need to do something like radioactive power. Yeah. So first of all, please understand this is a completely uninformed, unprofessional, amateur question. Uh huh. In your upper right corner of the slide, mm -hmm. the last two, the last two panels showing the two objects coming closer together. Mm hmm. Should I think of the, the moment that they first touched, they sort of bumped into each other mm -hmm. or bounced, or they came in with such speed that they actually generated enough heat? some sort of melting and then like as if he dissipates some sort of fusion like refreezing together. Is it certain it looks fused and not to That is an excellent question. In fact it's one that was kicked around by the team a lot. And one thing I skipped over quickly is not only if you look at there's been a lot of modeling, if you will, of taking two bodies in. Oh okay, let me back up. I, there's one thing I should throw out here. If this th object has the same density as cometary material, which we think it does, there's no reason not to. It looks like the smaller Kuiper Belt objects all seem to have about half a gram per centimeter cube. If you work out what that means is it is 70 to 80 percent vacuum. If I hand you a chunk of this stuff, think of the, of it's basically dirty icy dust bunnies like you have under your bed or wherever in your house, pardon me. I mean, we shouldn't go down that alley. The point is it looks like a dust, if you actually were to break it up, it's actually mostly empty space. So it's actually pretty weak. If I were to hand it to you, it would immediately just collapse. But these things weigh, I mean, these are giant, these are the size of Appalachian Mountains, like the one we're standing on. So think of it as like this very weak, very porous and fluffy, but it's a freight train, you know, it's moving kind of like the Titanic. It has a huge amount of momentum. So you'd imagine if they're moving with any appreciable velocity versus each other, they would cross each other and you'd see a lot of structure. That's one of the reasons why we know how to be slow. But another reason, I, I didn't go through this too much, is if you can actually try to calculate, if we know the shape, the um, moments of inertia. We can actually figure out how this body would rotate, as you were suggesting. And it turns out they line up almost perfectly. And we find that very, very fortuitous, shall we say. So more likely, was what happened is they rotate around each other, they probably got close enough, they totally locked. So by the time they actually did touch each other, no, th see, that's why it's a really good question. This was bothering us a lot. There's still one problem with this whole story. So we think that they were actually looking at each other and they kind of more than bounced around too much, we think that they probably just stuck. But look here, we call this the thumbprint. It kind of looks like it's possible that maybe they touched there first and ripped apart a little bit. There's also an angular momentum problem. If you just work out what two bodies that are not touching this or orbital period, we think we know the mass, it's four hours. It's rotating with 15 hours. So that's why you notice this little body here, it, it had to dump a lot of angular momentum somehow. We're still working on that. There's one other possibility, and rather than it throws out another body, is that this is happening, remember I mentioned there's a lot of gas around. In order to make this clumping, if these things are moving through gas, they can viscous drag. And there's a lot of people pushing that model. It's just simply they get slowed down by other stuff, by gas around. And since we know that the clumping shouldn't happen unless there's gas, it's a natural product. So we think that's going on as well. So viscous drag on the objects as well as the fact that they're probably tidally locked right before they touched. There's one more gentleman. Sure, that's a very good question, by the way. I know that we have tons of rods that we can fuel rods that we don't use that we store away. Mm -hmm. uh, other countries can repurpose them and recycle them. Uh, why can they be used as a public fuel source for these things? Can they be repurposed? That's a big question. It's not exactly related to this, but yes, there's lots of things you can do. Um, one of the people I work with, a fellow named Dr. Ralph McNutt of APL, um, uh, is an expert in nuclear isotopes that are used for spacecraft. And he's by the way one of the people you asked the question over here, who's helping get new plutonium 238 bread. He's actually the talking head expert that Congress goes to. Well, if you actually talk to Ralph, Ralph will tell you is that if you actually go back and look at the history of the first Russian rovers on the moon, they use polonium. Okay, the reason we use plutonium 238 is, you know, there's lots of reasons, but let me throw it out. You want something that doesn't emit anything and no gammas. You want, uh, you want its heat to come out basically as alpha particles, which you can stop with a piece of paper. You don't want to get gamma rays into your instruments. One. 
Two, you want an isotope that decays very quickly, but not so quickly it, it all disappears in the duration of your mission. So we knew we were going to have a 10, 20 year long mission. You want an isotope with a half-life of 50, 60, 70 years. That plutonium-238 got 80 years, if I recall. If you're sending something to the moon and you just want to go like that, which the Russians were doing in a week, polonium's got a half-life of, I think, months. So you actually get a lot more power per kilogram, right? Because it's really corking off. It's really decaying rapidly. So you don't need to use as much stuff, less mass in your spacecraft, everybody wins. But you also run out pretty fast. So there are different things you can select from. Uh, polonium is another one you can use. There are not too many other ones. But that, if you're asking why we wanted to breed up to plutonium-238, uh, a lot of it has to do with not interfering with your spacecraft. And the other has to do with exactly you want something that you can use that will work in the time scale you want it to work in. Any other questions? Yes? Why is oh. that type of material is just so compact? So you're asking, so the question is about what happens when the two bodies interact and how do they compact and would they shatter? So I want you to think, let's go back again to that dust bunny. I wasn't actually just throwing out. I like to call this icy Velcro. What you can do is they're, they're not really very solid at all. Um, I don't know if you ever played. What they'll do is when they hit each other, so imagine two snowballs that you haven't gone down and really tamped together. They're literally just going to interpenetrate and they'll, do, they'll compress and lose some of their pore space before they'll break. They, they, what you'll do is you'll crush. And so it wouldn't, we wouldn't be surprised if this neck is denser material than the average material here. It's been pushed and smooshed down. What you do with your hands when you're taking your snowball. But remember, this, we, we, our best guess is that these guys have been very loosely accreted. There has never been a massive heating and melting of the sun. There's no rock in the core. They haven't been ever really compressed by gravity very much, which is, I did go over it fast, but the reason I did have the densification plot in here Okay, so the trends we see in the Kuiper Belt. Really big guys like Pluto and Eris and Triton, they're up at two, two grams per centimeter cubed. Okay, they're high. Yet we think they're made out of billions and billions of Kuiper little guys, to misquote Carl Sagan. The little tiny guys, as you get smaller and smaller, and you go over to even Comet 67P, which is way over here in terms of diameter, they all seem to be very low. So what we think is happening is simply is that as you get larger and larger, you start crushing. The gra it's self gravity just starts crushing down and you lose all that pore space and eventually you can actually get melting and differentiation and get rock in the center. So the really little guys we think have just kind of loosely aggregated and stuck together but they haven't done that. And, but you're exactly right in thinking that maybe some of that happened because you have to dissipate that last momentum when they, when they come together. Something had to happen there and you would think that there's a little bit of stress here. The problem is we also, we don't have an exact number for the mass. We never did. We can only estimate it. Um, we know that if it's too dense, that at the current rate, if we make these things like 10 grams per centimeter, I think, no, I'm sorry. If we make them a gram per centimeter cube, there would be so much mass in this one and this one at the rotation rate, they should fly apart for all the reasonable strength. So we know they can't be too, too massive, too dense. We can put a lower limit to them uh, as well for, I'm trying to remember, there's a little, our ranges right now are the very conservative of 0.2 grams per centimeter cube to 0.8. Your average comet is 0.5, so half as much as water. The reason why we say that means it had to be mostly porous, in case I didn't describe myself, is that rock is about 3.5 grams per centimeter cubed. Water is one. There are about equal amounts of rock and water, we think, roughly speaking. So if you were just naively, if they were per there was no pore, no, no porosity, one, take one and 3.5 divide by two, they should be about two, two and a, half, two and a quarter density. They're 0.5. They're a factor of four less. So that means 75% of them has to be nothing. If I've, I've gone a little quickly, but you can, yeah, you can do the algebra. So that's why we think they're really porous. Um, yes? <coughs> okay. Please. Good luck. I hope the weather holds up. If it doesn't, I can always talk to you about a muamu, or I have plenty of other things I work on. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>